Well, Dr. Khatib Basri, I'm absolutely delighted that you could join me here at the ANU. The night before we commence the third annual Crawford Australian Leadership Forum, which, as you know, is designed to try to improve the quality of public policy decision making in this country, which, like most other parts of the world, I think um, falls far short of the quality we would like it to be. And I don't think we've been particularly impressed that things are changing as a result of the election campaign that we've just been uh, trying to wind our way through. But what we aim to do, as you know, with the Crawford Forum is bring together, with the help of a dozen or so international experts like yourself, 50 each of the best and brightest by invitation only from the business sector, from the public sector and politicians, and from the research and advocacy uh, community. The hope being that if we at least can have an intelligent, highly interactive discussion, uh, that we will be able to develop something of a common mindset, crossing party lines, ideological lines, about how to tackle some of these huge problems, whether they're geostrategic problems, whether they're economic problems, or whether they're to do with the, the survival environmentally of the planet. So that's the context in which uh, we're meeting. That's the context in which you're joining us, for which we're extremely grateful. It's terrific to have a former ANU um, student and PhD graduate uh, back joining us, and you're here as a visiting professor at the ANU as well. So, Katib, what are the, um, what are the particular issues that you're going to be uh, addressing during the course of the forum? We have you in a plenary session tomorrow on the global economy, state thereof, and we have you much more specifically in a breakfast session talking about the particular issues facing the emerging economies. But how would you describe the nature of the policy challenge, or the major policy challenge, and the operation of the global economy at the moment? Well, first of all, Greg, uh, I would like to uh, thank the ANU for having me in this prestigious forum. It's always good to be back to ANU. And I think this forum is very timely because uh, the world, I would say the world is at the crossroad at this moment. Um, we have seen that the global economy is slowing down. At the same time, the inequality is rising. If we are in the past, we are talking about the always trade off between this high economic growth and then inequality. But nowadays, even the slowdown of growth is accompanied by rising inequality. And people are talking maybe some of this attributed to the uh, global capitalist system. But probably uh, it's very important for us to look at this issue more carefully yeah, about what kind of uh, government you know, nation states can do to minimize the impact of this slowdown of the global growth, the growing inequality. Because I think it's hard for us to jump to the conclusion that the capitalism is wrong or that. Yeah, but maybe we have to discuss in a more detail, in more in-depth about what we can do to minimize the impact. What are the major policy instruments available to us? I mean, monetary policy no longer seems to be doing anything to lift us out of the growth doldrums or to solve, obviously, any of the micro problems and the distributional problems. What are the levers we have? I think, I think one of the important thing is we have to strike the balance now between the market, uh, agents, regulators, and the institution. Because uh, nowadays, as we've seen that, you know, the financial market is growing very fast, but not able to provide a better job for many people. Yeah. At the same time, we have to support that many people, especially in the poor country, in the developing countries, so the government intervention is needed. But at the same time, we also learn from our history about the government failure, for example. That could be dangerous as well. So there is no single magic bullet you know, related to this. We cannot solve this problem only using these economic tools like monetary policy or fiscal policy. It should be an institutional setup as well. And I think allowing criticisms is also very important because one thing that we are facing in the, you know, in the recent development is the current system probably will not provide the best solution. Yeah? So we need the criticism. And I think if you're talking about from the political perspective, the democratic institution is also very important. At least that's what I learned from the Indonesian experience. When we allow the democratic system 
people can channel their criticisms so the government can provide a sort of like a self-correction about what kind of policy of needed. This kind of system, I think, is very important. How much more challenging are the economic problems facing policymakers today as compared with my generation? I think back to the Hawke-Keating era when we got a lot of kudos for the way in which we handled essentially the challenges of a globalising economy and the implications domestically in terms of jobs and growth for that. But now it's an almost completely different kind of problem, the digitalizing economy and this dramatic pace of change, which has caught everybody rather breathlessly. I mean, is it fundamentally different or is it just another set of challenges that sensible policy making can overcome? I think the issue is about the adjustment process. Yeah, because, because if you're talking about this digitalization, this is not the first time that the industrial revolution happened. Yeah. Um, but the problem is how the country can make an adjustment of it. I can imagine, for example, like the innovation, the disruptive innovation or technology can have an impact on the inequality, growing inequality, on the displacements of workers. But don't forget that technology will also improve the productivity and could provide the jobs in the medium and the longer term. So the question is, how do we adjust in the short term and provide a sort of like protection for the in favor uh, one? Just one final issue in particular about your own region, ASEAN and Indonesia within it, and you of course being a former recently uh, Indonesian finance minister. How serious are ASEAN's economic problems at the moment? And what, if anything, can we do in Australia to help resolve them? Well. If you compare, relatively speaking, compared to other regions, the economic growth in ASEAN is still relatively high, higher compared to other regions. But one thing, the most difficult problem in most of the ASEAN countries is needed now is about the poor quality of infrastructure. And on this particular issue, I think Australia can play a role. I recall when I was a Minister of Finance, um, in the G20 meeting 2014, we discussed also about this, you know, putting the table of the infrastructure agenda. Where there's something that the country like Indonesia need, the CMLV need, most of the country in ASEAN are need that. And, and certainly Australia with their knowledge, advanced knowledge and experience could have uh, helped the many Asian countries related to this particular agenda. Well, Dr. Kati Basri, I think with your knowledge and experience and your presence here, you're going to help us wrestle with a lot of these issues and hopefully come to some sensible, consensual agreement about how these things uh, and many others, these issues should be challenged and should be responded to. So thank you very much for joining us uh, for this conference and I look forward very much to the pleasure of your company and your engagement over the next couple of days. I think it's going to be a very stimulating event. Thank you, Kati. Thank Great you. to talk to you.